morning everyone. Today I'm at Musselboro. It's all about capturing birds in flight today. I'll be going over a few of the things that you need to think about when doing this sort of project. If you haven't seen any of my videos before, my name is Espen and my channel is all about wildlife photography. Another thing I think is really important is location. Go to a place where there's plenty of stuff happening. Excuse me. couple of mute swans just flying by there. Sorry about that. I think location is very important when you're practicing capturing birds in flight. Because you want to come to a place where that has loads of action so you're not standing about just waiting for a bird to fly. And I've come to an estuary which is usually a very good place to come. We got the river esque here in Musselboro coming out to meet the sea here in the fourth. And it, we just have so much, so much bird activity here. I mean, there's loads of gulls. If you saw here, there's a few swans, there's ducks. And there's also down along the shore here, we've got loads of waders and seabirds like shag, cormorants. It's just a, a bit large variety of birds and there's always something going on. So find yourself a place nearby where there's loads going on, loads of bird activity and loads of birds in flight which is just going to give you that much more practice when you actually go out and do this. Now for capturing birds in flight, I think manual exposure is the best way to go. For capturing birds in flight, you should cry fast, you're going to need a shutter speed which is going to be able to freeze the action. Today, mostly I'll be shooting medium sized birds. I'm going to be shooting these gulls that are flying about, some of the bigger waders, uh, and some ducks. Now the size of the bird is often going to be a good indication of how fast your shutter speed needs to be. It's a good indication of how fast the bird is in flight. Small songbirds are going to need a very high shutter speed. Medium sized birds like this you could probably get away with something like... I'm going to try out 1600th of a second at first and see how we get on with that. It's a little bit of a trial and error. So taking some test shots and seeing if it's enough to freeze the action is the way to go. So for dialing in my manual exposure now, I'm going to be pointing my camera at one of these white gulls down here. And I want to be setting my shutter speed to 1600th of a second. That's what I want to start with. I want to start wide open at 5.6, f5.6, which is what this lens has on 400 millimeters. That way I'll dial my ISO in to what the camera recommends. So I'll go over here. Let's see, that's a little bit underexposed. Increase my ISO to 500. A little bit too much. Down to 400. That's it. Take a test shot. Have a look at that. And as you can see here now, camera's already fooled. But I got my highlights blinkies on, so the whiteness on that bird is overexposed. So I'm going to have to override the camera settings. This is why you want to be in manual. And I'm going to go down. I'm going to make the ISO was now 400. I'm going to make it 200 and take another test shot. Okay, no, no uh, blown highlights there. So my settings for the lighting conditions right now for a white bird is shutter speed 1600th of a second, f5.6, ISO 200. If I don't get sharp, as sharp images as I would like to have, I'm going to try and put my f-stop up to maybe 7.1 to get a larger depth of field in focus. It's easier to get a bird sharp. Then I'm going to have to increase my ISO to match that so I get the correct exposure. Um, and that's basically it. It's not that difficult to go for manual exposure. If you're just used to shooting an aperture or shutter speed priority, then I would suggest that you try out spot metering mode. And what that does is that the camera will put most emphasis on getting the exposure for what's in the middle part of your frame right. So that means that it's going to be a little bit more accurate to expose for the bird, or it's just taking in all the surrounding elements. Uh, still though, you're probably going to want to use the exposure compensation dial on the back so that when you're aiming up in the sky and you have a brighter background, 
you want to dial in some overexposure. And sometimes as much as two stops, one stop might be good with if you're using spot metering. You're just gonna, it's a little bit of trial and error, so just try that out. And if you get a dark background, you may want to dial it back a bit and underexpose the image in case um, the bird uh, is overexposed. And it's a very good idea to set on the highlight indicator so that when you check out the LCD screen of your image, then any highlights, anything that's been blown out will get a blink on the highlights. And that will give you a, just an indication right away that will tell you that you overexpose your image. Uh, and you can just check that out in your manual for your camera, how to set that, or look up another YouTube video online. If you're in a different situation than for me here, maybe you're at a pond or a lake or anything like that, and you're waiting for birds to take off, it's a good idea to position yourself so that the, the wind is coming from you to the birds. Because most birds, especially this is especially for larger birds, um, medium to larger size birds will take off into the wind. They need that extra draft on the, under their wings when they take off. And once we have our shutter speed set and our manual exposure set, let's go ahead and change the focusing point. Now I tend to use one middle focusing point. Um, I sometimes I change that to five points in the middle. I have a video on how to basically get a little bit faster with uh, the focus for the Canon 7D, which also will work on many of the other Canon models, which you can check out in the link above. So I tend to swap between one and five, depending on if it's easy enough to catch the bird. And I know that for a lot of people, they may want to put their focusing point off to the side to get the right composition. Uh, I feel that the middle focusing point I think is a lot better so I like to just keep it in the middle and I will crop to get my composition in post. Now when it comes to the autofocus you want to be keeping continuous focus so that once you lock your focusing point pressing the shutter speed halfway or the back button focus whichever one you use then uh, it's gonna, your camera is just going to continuously focus on the subject I'm going to put that on and also use burst mode. I use uh, high burst mode, which allows me, I don't know, 9 or 10 frames per second or something like that, which is going to be quite important because that the, burst, the birds fly so fast that you're better off shooting many shots so you can pick out the one that's going to look best, the one that's going to have, be the sharpest. They're not all going to become sharp. There might be loads of little differences to uh, when you get your best shot. So burst mode and just delete and post. Now I will mention as well that on newer DSLRs there is a way of um, changing the sensitivity of the focusing point and that basically means that if you if you kind of lose your focusing point off the bird if it's set to very sensitive then your camera will instantly focus on whatever's behind it or whatever else it hits. Whereas if the sensitivity isn't that sensitive, it'll give you a little bit of a lag period, enough for you to find the bird again. So it's a good idea not to have it too sensitive. I'm not gonna go in on how to do that. I might do that in a different video where you can look it up online if, you are, if you're curious about that. But that sensitivity of the focusing is quite a good idea to have it just at neutral, not overly sensitive. That means that you have an extra second or so to find the bird before the focusing starts shifting in and out. Now a tip for actually finding the birds in flight. It can actually be quite tricky to find the birds in flight when you're trying to capture them somewhere in the sky where you've seen them and you want to get point your camera to them. Um, and the, the trick about that is the same for using binoculars. If you're a birder and you're used to using binoculars, it's the same idea. You want to keep your eye on the bird while you just lift your camera and your lens straight up and not taking your eye off the area where you saw the bird or even if it's continuously in flight you want to be able to, you want to kind of predict where it goes and just follow along with your eye as you point your camera up that takes a little bit of practice you'll probably get it wrong in the beginning i know i definitely did um, but the more you do it the easier that gets as when it comes to taking interesting birds flight images obviously any kind of behavior or action, interaction with other birds can be quite interesting. 
uh, using compositional rules such as you know if there's uh, odd numbers of birds like three birds is better than two or four those kind of things uh, when it comes to the background for, for the birds it's a good idea to actually have something in the background not just aiming it up at the sky if all you have is a blue sky or a white blown out background it's just not going to look that interesting so trying to get the bird either on the horizon so you get part of the horizon in the background or even with a blurred out background of uh, land itself can often be a lot more interesting than an empty blue sky uh, if you do use sky as a background dark stormy clouds is going to be it's going to look really cool especially if you can get light sunlight on the bird but with a dark stormy background that can make some interesting images Being positioned a little bit elevated can be really helpful for the gull species here that are kind of flickering up and down. That way it's a little bit easier for me to get like the horizon in my frame um, as I'm taking photos. And then there's also a lot of low flying birds over here like ducks and for them, for the best images for them would be to go down and lie down on the sand right next to the water's edge and try and capture that really nice eye level shot. Let's try and go down there and get low to the ground. All right, I'm gonna find a place to lie down right over here. I'll have the sun on my back and open for front lit images of birds. Right away, I'm getting much more interesting shots down here than I was up there. Water is actually right behind me. Let's turn move. Uh, I'm not going to go very close. The tide is going to bring the birds to me. I don't want to scare them all away. Plenty of dogs in the area that can do that for me. So I'm going to lie down here, a bit away from them, and a bit away from the incoming tide. As I said though, now it's quite good the water's coming in fast, the birds are just coming closer and closer to me. I'm also getting some nice portrait shots. great thing about lying down like this and uh, being here before the birds is that they're totally fine with me. I mean, they have to get really close before they're actually bothered about me lying here. There's a much better way of approaching wildlife is actually not approaching but letting them come to you. Alright, well this has been an amazing morning and I hope that you've taken away some tips from this video. Uh, if you have any other suggestions that other people might learn from, something that I've missed out, leave a comment. And if you're new to this channel, my name is Espen. This channel is all about wildlife photography, so please consider subscribing if, um, if you like these sort of videos. And I'll see you in the next video.